I love the repetitive nature of that song. I know people who call those songs 7-Eleven songs. You sing the same seven words 11 times. You know what I'm talking about, 7-Eleven songs. Uh, but, but sometimes without repetition, we, we forget who God is in our lives. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have to be told more than once. <laughs> you too? And, and I think in this moment, like we could just sing these words, but I don't want to ignore the fact that, that God wants to remind you that if you don't hear anything else today, the one thing he wants you to know is that God is for you. God is for you. Uh, in moments that we can't see him, he's with us, he's beside us, he's behind us, he's within us. I, I don't know if you feel forgotten today. I don't know what your struggle is, but I believe today if you leave with anything else, this could be the one thing that God is for you and you can receive the power of his blessing and your life today, amen. Hey church, would you do me a favor? Would you welcome all of our first time guests into the room? Would you welcome our Ironton campus? Today we have Katie joining us from work, Amy and Ironton, Lisa Wester Heidi and Sarah McCall all joining us online today. We are grateful for our online family. Uh, we're gonna continue our, what I'm calling a summer conversation. Too short to be a series, <laughs> too long to be a one-off message. And I just want to preface this by saying, if you missed last weekend at church, yo, you missed a great weekend to be at church. Oh my gosh, where were half of you? <laughs> uh, we were praying with a different level of faith that God would meet us in a powerful way. And last week we watched people experience salvation. We watched strongholds be broken in people's lives. All while talking about the power of giving. <laughs> it's fascinating what can happen when we do that. So I want to continue this conversation today around this idea of don't hold back. And uh, I'm going to be reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6. So if you got a Bible, open your Bibles. If you got a Bible app, you can open those as well. As I say every week, if you don't have a Bible, we believe in the power of God's Word. We believe in what it says. We believe in what it can do. And so if you leave today, feel free to grab a free Be Hope Bible on the way out. Let's dive in and let's get to work. This is what it says, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse six, Paul says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves people who cheer what they champion. Verse eight. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work that God has called you to do. Uh, here's what I want to do in our time together. Often when we talk about uh, conversations around giving, we get uncomfortable because we struggle with giving to the church. I want you to know at Be Hope, we believe that you don't give to the church, but we believe you give through the church. There's a big difference. Like giving is not just what God is doing inside of you, but it's about what God is doing through you when you learn to live generously. The same works collectively as a whole. That God is working in powerful ways through our generosity. Let me say it this way. We believe living generously changes lives. And so when we say we cheer what we champion, I believe that one of the markers of who we are at Be Hope is that we are genuinely joyful and excited because we get to see God move in powerful ways every single week. We get to see his miracles. We get to see his blessings. We get to experience his joy. Some of you have experienced his healing. We see God work in miraculous ways, but it's through our generosity in which that happens. So title a message today because of what God wants to do through you is called Unlock the Blessing. Un Lock the blessing. Turn to your neighbor and say, unlock the blessing. And then let's pray as we begin our time together. God, we're so grateful for the work that you're about to do. We look forward to the ways in which you're going to speak to us. And I pray today that we wouldn't leave here changed, but you would change us in powerful ways to live for your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, come on, high five two people, then grab a seat. Let's get going.
I want to start with best weekend ever. How many of you have ever been part of best weekend ever at Beob Church? All right. How many of you have never experienced the best weekend ever at Beob Church? Okay, good. We got a handful of people. Good news. Best weekend ever is on the way. It's going to be the best time of your life. It's the week after Labor Day weekend. Put it in your calendars now, September 7th and 8th. We're going to be grooving and moving. But we love best weekend ever because we get to invite people into the presence of God. And we believe it's a great way to show people that God is fun. I don't know if your God's boring. My God's not boring. And we just believe that it's a great opportunity to invite people into a church that is excited about what God is doing and to show them that God is a lot of fun, but can also change your hearts at the same time. So let me talk about best weekend ever. Last be- what best weekend ever, uh, we were finishing up a renovation, what we called Compel 1.0. And so the room that you're in now didn't look like it does right now. At one point last year, there were pews, uh, the screens and all of this was different. And so we finished the lighting the week of best weekend ever. And so we hired a lighting engineer company to come in to program the lights because, well, we didn't have time to program them nor to learn on it, okay? Does this make sense? And uh, because I'm a three-year-old, I'm not a micromanager. I'm a three-year-old. I'm always interested in what's happening at this place. I was walking around, and I I decided to walk into the sanctuary on midweek, and as I walked in, all the lights were flashing everywhere. Like, it was crazy, but there was no music. It was confusing. It's like silent disco. Is that still a thing? (laughs) Silent disco, like everybody's doing their own thing, but there's no music, it's silent in the room. That's kind of what it was like. And, and so I'm looking around, I'm like, who's programming lights? And so I look up in this booth right back here and there's a, a light engineer and this dude's wearing headphones. And so I walk up to the booth and I knock on it because he can't hear me. And I said, excuse me, sir. <laughs> could, could you help me understand what you're doing? And he said, well, I'm programming lights. That's what you pay me to do. I'm like, I realize that, but why are you wearing headphones? This doesn't make sense to me. And, and, and this is what he said. This was so powerful, church. He said, listen, to get the lights right, you have to have the level of sound right. And he said, the mistake that people make is they think that you program lights to the style of the song. But he said, this is what you, you will learn if you ever become an engineer. I'm going to teach you what it takes to be a light engineer today. <laughs> is you will naturally program the lights based on the level of noise that is in your ear. Does this make sense, church? Yeah. Okay, I know some of you have, you're like technically not inclined at all. And so let me give you an example of what I'm talking about today. <laughs> Maybe this will be helpful. And I promise, I'm going somewhere with this. So here's what he was saying. Let's take the first song that we sang at this service. If you missed the first song, <laughs> we're early people. <laughs> you don't want to miss anything at Be Hope Church. And uh, the first song was all in, kind of an upbeat song, right? Pretty upbeat, pretty powerful. And um, I want to show you what happens when you take this fast song, but you play it at a really low level. Watch what happens to the lights. Come on, production. Yeah. Slow moving lights, kind of soft, easy going, right? But it's weird because you have this fast song that's playing, but yet the lights naturally move according to the level of sound. Now, now let me show you the other side of this. Uh, we also just sang The Blessing, kind of a slow song, but a very powerful song. Now, watch what happens to the lights when we play it at a louder level. Watch this now, ready? Yeah. There's movement, there's intensity. Like lights are going off because of the sound, the level at which we are listening to the music within our ears. Does this make sense, church? If you're with me, everybody give me an amen. Just raise your hand and say, this makes sense to me. Cool, awesome, we can cut it off, they get it now, (laughs) that's good. And you're like, Pastor Brad, what does this light show have to do with my faith? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked, church. I think, I think in terms of parables and I think in terms of physical examples that we can bring things to life. Here's what it has to do with your faith. Is I believe that the light you see represents the blessing of God. That's what the light represents. It represents the blessing of God. Pastor Brad, what is God's blessing? Let me make this as clear as possible. 
God's blessing is when broken and hurting people enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and they begin to experience the power of his forgiveness, his grace, his joy, his love, and his mercy. That is what God's blessing is. Let me just make it plain. God's blessing is when people understand that God is for them and that they can have a relationship with him. Is this clear? That's what the lights represent, God's blessing. So here's what the sound represents. Think about the sound engineer. He's got microphones, he's got headphones in his ear. What does the sound represent? I believe the sound, the level of noise, represents the level of faith at which you are listening to God. You with me on this, church? You can either listen to God at this level or you can listen to God at this level. The sound represents the level of faith that you believe God is able. So we have two components. We have light, which is the blessing of God. And then we have sound, which is the level of faith which you and I live. But there's one more component that we haven't talked about. Did, did you know there's one more com component when it comes to lights? Did you guys know this? Cool, I'm gonna teach you today. So let's go on a field trip. I love field trips. Hey man, that's a cool shirt, you're looking good today. <laughs> this is so much fun, your faces are beautiful. I never get to come back here. Congratulations. My man, look at you. Ready? Look at this guy studying God's word. This is what it's all about. He's got a Bible in his hands, this man's ready to go. I love that. So, so here's the thing, in order to take the level of faith that we have, the sound that we hear, and project it into the lights, you need a light board, which has channels. Does this make sense? Let me say it this way. Galatians 5 says, faith expresses itself in love. I'm gonna phrase it this way. Faith lives through channels. It gets channeled. Your faith gets channeled in the gifting that God has given you. Some of you don't know this yet, but God has gifted you in powerful ways. And when you lean into the gifting and the way that God has wired you, guess what? When you lean fully in faith into that, you begin, did I hit a button? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Sometimes these things don't always work. <laughs> you begin to extend the light of God's blessing into the world. Wait, we say this, give God the first five of your day. When you give God the first five of your day and you're in his word and you're leaning and growing in faith because of his word, is this working? I don't think this one's working. Here we go. Watch this now, church. I don't know if this is gonna work today, but we're gonna try to make it make sense. Let's just go to these other channels. You got prayer, you got serving. I believe that generosity is one of the channels in which we get to shed the light, the beauty, the blessing, unlock the blessing of God into the world. And here's what I wanna show you. If one of these channels of faith is off, you don't get to see the full blessing of God. And so some of us are living at this level, and then others of you are living in full faith at this level. And the blessing of God gets unlocked in the world in front of us. Let me just say this to you today. Don't let your faith be the limit to unlocking God's blessing in the world. Can we preach and run at the same time? Here's why I say that. It's because God's desire is to pour out his blessing on the entire world. Malachi 3.10 says, test me in this, test me in the tithe, test me in giving, and see if I won't open up the floodgates of heaven. See if I won't pour out my blessing in such a powerful way that you cannot contain the beauty of who God is. He said, that's my desire. But guess what? You either block it or you get to unlock it. You get to choose. God's gonna accomplish whatever God's gonna accomplish, but here's the reality. You get to choose on whether he uses you or he uses somebody else that is obedient, willing, and lives at a greater level of faith. And so the question I need to pose to you this morning is, what level of faith are you listening to God? What level of faith 
Are you listening to God? I need you to sit with that for a minute. I'm going to come back to it, okay? So think about it, but also think about what we're talking about in just a second. Because here's what's at stake when we listen to God down here. Here's what's at stake when, when the decibel levels aren't loud enough in our faith. And this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6. Notice what he says. Remember, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will reap generously. Church, Paul is giving his Corinthian church a little bit of correction. Uh, we like to say here, we're having an honest conversation. <laughs> he said, remember. And if he's telling them to remember, it means that they forgot. They forgot something. And here's the question I'm asking. What did they forget? It doesn't tell us in the Bible, but what we do know is over the course of a year, there is a shift in their mindsets about generosity and God. How do I know that? Because the backstory of this verse is that there is a church in Jerusalem where all the disciples are hanging out and growing the church. And then somebody didn't like it. And so somebody decided to kill off all the Christians and persecute them. And as they persecuted them, they took their land, they took their money, they took their spouses, they took everything they could, which left the church in poverty. Yo, they're poor. <laughs> the church in Jerusalem has no money. And so fascinating enough, Paul, who used to persecute the church in Jerusalem, is now suddenly taking up a collection from all the other churches to help out this church. Does this make sense? And the Bible tells us that at first they were pumped about this. They were the first to give. But something happened over the course of the year that changed their mind about what God was calling them to do. In order to show you what happened, I need to take you back to chapter 8. Just flip over a page in your Bible. At least in my Bible, that's how it works. And I want to show you in verse 7 what, what happens. This is what it says in verse 7. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I'm not commanding you. I love that. I'm not telling you you have to. But I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Let's go to verse 10. And here is my judgment. He puts down the gavel. I've always wanted to be a judge. This is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were not only the first to give, but you also had the desire to do so. Now finish the work. I love what he says. So your eagerness and your willingness to do so may be matched by the completion of it according to your means. I love what Paul said. Let me give it to you, BLT. He's saying, yo, you're cheering, but you're not championing. <laughs> Paul's like, let's take up a collection. Everybody's like, woo, let's cheer. <laughs> and then they started passing the buckets in the Corinthian church, and people are like, nope. I'm not touching that, <laughs> that thing. How many of you know that's how you feel sometimes when the bucket's going for He says, you're cheering, but you're not championing. And then Paul really begins to pick it apart. And this is what he says in verse 12 that's so powerful. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. Let me teach you for just a second. Because it doesn't tell us why they stopped giving. Here's what I believe. The problem isn't that they don't believe in God. You can have faith in God and still not give. You could probably still go to heaven. I don't know if that's true. That's just a guess. The pro he says you have faith. The problem isn't that you don't believe in God. The problem is that you have stopped financially supporting what God is actually about. You've stopped supporting what God loves. And what God loves is broken people who don't know him. And you first started out with the desire to reach people who didn't know Jesus. We call them first church people at Be Hope. You had that desire. But what has happened over time is you have lost sight of what you love. Your desire to reach people has been replaced with something. I love what he says. I need to test the sincerity of your love because you've lost it. And the way he does that, he said, yo, excel in this giving. Complete the work. Work with me on this church. 
giving in love requires sacrifice. When you give in love, it requires a sacrifice. But sacrifice without love leads to scarcity. Oh, that's good. I don't think, I don't think you get it. Let me explain it in terms of cars. Some of you love your new car. And so you are willing to sacrifice the $750 car payment that you will make because you love the car. But how many of you know you you got a car that's like probably five, six years old and you're still making the same payments on that thing and you don't love it anymore. You're thinking about how I could take this money and buy a new car with it. Like you're focused on what, oh no, see what's happening now. You're focused on what you don't have. And isn't this what Paul says in verse 12? He said, your problem is that you're trying to give a gift according to what you don't have. You have switched from a generosity mindset to a scarcity mindset. And Paul's like, scarcity will always block the blessing of God. And I need you to change your mind about who God is. Church, let me just confess to you in this moment. This is my struggle. Listen, if you want a perfect pastor, go to another church. (laughs) Let me confess to you today. Because God always has a way of giving me stories when I'm trying to teach you the story that I'm preaching. So so here's how it happened in my life. I'm writing this message, and I also wrote you a letter to say, what would happen if we decided to take our two-year contribution for Compel, this expansion, and we narrowed it down to one year? And I'm like, let's do it. I'm going to give. I know I haven't planned for it. We're going to make it happen. I got really excited. Yes, we get to give. I was enthusiastic. And then in the same week... My wife's car, because I told you we drive old cars, broke down. It went into the shop, and the guy fixed it, and he called me up, and he said, it's all ready to go. That'll be $25.63. And I'm like, $25.63? And he's like, no, $2,500 is what you're going to have to pay. "Mm, Okay. And then my car went in the shop in the same week. And they called me back, and they're like, that'll be $25.63. And I'm like... $25.63? He's like, no, $2,500 is what it's going to cost you. In one week, church, i got to come up with five Gs. And then my wife, who I absolutely adore and love because she runs our schedules and our calendars, comes to me and said, honey, uh, camp payments do. And I know that our youth pastor knows that we paid late, didn't we? (laughs) The kids barely made it to camp. (laughs) Camp payments do, soccer payments do, braces payments are due. Like, it's all due. You know it too, don't you? I got to come up with all this money. But I just told the church that I would give my second half of my contribution. And I went from, yeah, let's do this, to "Mm, maybe I don't have it. I got focused on what I didn't have. I started living with a scarcity mindset. I wonder how many of you in this conversation right now are struggling with the conversation because you're focused on what you don't have. Pastor, I don't have it because I, got a, I need a new dishwasher. I, I don't have enough because tuition is due at the beginning of the semester. I, I don't have it because, well, we had a hailstorm and I need a new roof and I'm not sure if the insurance is going to cover it. And so I got to figure out, do I pay for the roof or do I pay this mortgage? I don't know which one I'm going to do. Can we talk about... At what point did 100 become the new 20? (laughs) This is just my philosophy. But I'm convinced that what used to be $20 has now cost us $100. Like everything in my cart went up. (laughs) And I'm like, that was 20, now it's 100. I don't have $100 sitting around to pay for that thing. You know what's funny is is talking about people who who get focused on what they don't have. I always find it interesting that people will say to me, I'll give when I have this much in savings. I'll give when I get this job. I'll give when my wife goes to work. Or I'll give when he goes back to work. And, and you know what we're doing is, is we're actually biblically obedient because we're basing our future giving on what we don't have. Which means you're still living in a scarcity mindset. And I told you, Scarcity blocks the blessing of God. And Paul's like, you got to change your tune, bro. (laughs) You got to change it up. 
And do you notice what Paul does in this story? It's so good. He said, let me test the sincerity of your love by comparing it to others. And who does he compare it to first? In verse nine, chapter eight, he says, this is dirty, church. This is absolutely dirty, what Paul, he's doing these people. He said, for you know the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. (laughs) Oh, that's bad. That's wrong, dude. He's comparing their love to the greatest homie in the world himself, Jesus Christ. I don't know about you. I wore a lot of WWJD bracelets back in the early 2000s, and it did not change how I lived like Jesus. I was the, still the same broken sinner that I was, pretty much because I didn't believe in God. I just thought it looked really cool, and it made me look more holy. <laughs> but how many of you know that sometimes we struggle to, to love like Jesus, to live like Jesus? And Paul is not telling them that you have to be Jesus. He's saying, I need you to change your thought process about who God is. Because God doesn't live with a scarcity mindset. God doesn't so sparingly. Pastor Brad, how do you know that? John 3.16 in the Brad's Living Translation says, For God so, not S-O, S-O-W, for God so loved the world that he generously sent this only seed that was planted on the cross, whose name was Jesus Christ, who was hung for you so that you would come out of the loneliness, despair, depression, strongholds, and sin of your life, and you would experience the fullness and grace and joy of who God is. God didn't hold hold back from you. God went all in with you. Why? Because you are his first love. You are God's first love. God is for you. He is with you. He is beside you. God is for you. And if God is for you and he lives generously, then why don't we? Why do we live in scarcity? And Paul's like, I got to take you to a different place. You can't live there, Corinthians, anymore. And so this is what he does. This is his declaration over their life in chapter 9, verse 8. He said, and God is able to bless you abundantly. How many of you know that just because God is able doesn't mean he will? Just because God has the ability doesn't mean he will always pour out his blessing. And church, I'm just going to make this as clear as I can. It really has nothing to do with God and it has everything to do with you. Let's stop talking about God's ability and let's talk about your ability for just a second. Because here's what I find is I have so many people who have potential and ability in their life. God has gifted them in powerful ways. And what happens is you end up comparing your life to other people who are wired differently than you are. We are all different in the house of God today. God has wired you uniquely just to be you. And what happens is we start looking at how other people are. I can't lead like them. I can't preach like them. I can't read the Bible like them. I can't parent like them. I'm not a good student like them. Well, maybe God never made you a good student. Maybe you're not good at test taking. And what happens is the moment we compare our abilities to people who are wired differently, watch what happens. You get focused on what you don't have instead of what God has wired you with. And Paul still plays the comparison game. He said, let me compare your faith, not your financial circumstance. Let me compare your faith with the church that is getting it right. Go back to to chapter eight, starting at verse two. Notice what he says. He says, I got to go back there real quick. Watch what he said. Macedonian churches, he said, in the midst of their severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up into rich generosity. That's fun to say. Notice this. All they have is joy. They don't have money. Do you know what the Corinthian church has? No joy and lots of money. (laughs) Complete opposite. 
And he said, they've got joy, no money, and it's swelled up into rich generosity. For I testify, watch this now, that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. What would, what would Paul say about that in verse, verse, uh, verse eight in chapter nine? He said, abundantly. I think the Macedonian church was the inspiration for Paul writing what he writes when he said, and God is able to bless you abundantly. They gave what they were able and God took it beyond their ability. Let, let me just play it, make it plain. They took their little and they let God do a lot. Let me, let me just tell you today, the difference in these churches is their view of the source determined how they sowed. I'm gonna make it another way. Your view of God will determine how you give. And the difference in these churches is that their level of faith was not put in their ability, but it was put in God's ability. Not about what I can do, but it's about what God can do. And I just need to just pause for this moment and say, yo, quit working with what other people have and work with what God has given you. God has given you a calling. God has given you a gifting. God has specifically wired you to be you. And I'm just saying, quit looking at them and lean into the little that you have and let God work beyond your ability simply because you're willing to be obedient to the goodness of what he wants to do through you. See, see, church, let me, let me just show you. Sometimes I get really excited. I'm going to slow down for a minute. The question, they are, the Macedonian church is listening at a different level. Let's go back to it. They're listening at a different level than the Corinthian church. I want to go back to it because their view of the source changed the way they lived. So let me ask you this question. What level of faith are you listening to God? At what level of faith are you hearing from God? And here's what happens. Some of us, we listen down here. Um, tech team, can we give all those serving this weekend a hand? Because these are volunteers that are helping. Thank you so much. But, but some of you, you're listening to God at this level. Go for it. Well, well God didn't give me that, that salary. Why didn't God answer my prayer? <laughs> you can laugh at this, this is funny. <laughs> Why is the world always getting it wrong? Why does God always feel so absent in my life? How come they got the house, the kids, and the dog? Why did they get that job? Why do I always worry when I know I'm not supposed to worry? I really love control, even though I'm not in control. I, your view of the source determines how you sow. So if you listen to God at this level, a whiny level, a sparingly level, you will live a life that is far below what God has called you to. I also see some of the faces in the room. I love my students. Yo, these are some big faith people in the house today. And I believe that some people are listening to God at a louder level, at a higher level. Come on, let's do it, church. This is the level at which some of you are beginning to listen to God. Come on. Like some of you are like, I don't have a lot, but I'm gonna give everything that I've got. I know that I'm not gifted and I'm the best, but I'm gonna give God the little knowing he's gonna work beyond my ability. I know that I don't always feel the presence of God, but I know that my God is always faithful. I know that my situation is really bad, but I know that my God is still good. Some of you are living at a higher level of faith for which I am grateful. And you watch God take what your ability is and turn it into something that is abundant, beautiful, and unlocks the blessing of God in his light in the world. Amen, 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 amen. 
I gotta move, I gotta move, I gotta move. We're ending right here, I promise. And so I, I love what Paul says. I, I wanna continue with it. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, what does he say? You will abound in every good work that God has called you to do. The good work is unleashing and unlocking the blessing and of hope of Jesus in this world. Let me say it like this. We can't lose sight of what we love. And at Be Hope Church, as long as I'm your pastor and you still vote me in. <laughs> I'm kind of joking about that, not really. <laughs> it's my responsibility to make sure that we never lose sight of what we love. And what we love is the people that God loves. God loves the addicts. God loves the messy. God loves the broken. God loves the hopeless. God loves those suffering with cancer. God loves those who have their lives together. God loves every single person, and, and that's what we're about. And we want to be a first church kind of church. We want to see people come to faith and know Jesus for the first time in a powerful way. That's our first love. Yeah, yeah, that's good. But like Paul, yo, it's my job to remind you he said, remember, I'm going to say, don't forget. Can we have an honest conversation this morning? Because I need to remind you. Um, I'll smile to make this easier. <laughs> Let me show you something powerful. Um, this is our in-person uh, growth over the last two years. Some of you are like... <laughs> Hey guys, like, you don't even know the numbers. I love that you're, it could be one to five and you're like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Let me just say this. I, uh, two years ago, this was about like 1,300 people. Right now we're running around 1,800, 1,800 people in person consider Be Hope Church. It's fantastic, good stuff. But let me show you, let me show you. So you have this growth, but let me show you the number of first time givers who are getting on board with the thing that we love. You have new people coming, but you have people like, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm on board with what this church is about, what God is about. And I know all the statisticians and people who love Excel sheets, look at this and like, I could fix that with a system. <laughs> Will you do that and I'll do the pastor thing. And this is what, they don't, they don't teach you this in school, church, when you're becoming a pastor. They don't teach you how to read charts and numbers. So sometimes you just got to figure this out. And I'm like, God, hey, what are you saying to me about our church right now? And, and here's what I believe. There is a trend line that you don't see, which I believe it is a representation of our level of faith. And when you average out our giving, our giving and our growth, you almost get, I'm, I mean, it's almost flat. I'm not a doctor. We have any doctors in the house today? Raise your hand in case somebody has a heart attack here in the next minute. But I'm pretty convinced. I've been at the hospital when people have flatlined. That's not a good thing. You're dying. You may be dead. And that's not who we are. Like, this is not, flatlining is not the level of faith at which Be Hope operates. I need us to lift our level, not of generosity. I need you to lift your level of faith. Church, I'm practicing, practicing, practicing this in my own life. Last week, last week, we were giving this giving message and I just said, I, I wanna have a call to salvation where people come forward. And I had this sort of doubt in my life, this scarcity, what if nobody comes forward? <laughs> And God's like, it's not about people coming forward. It's about the level of faith at which you believe I can do a miracle. And church, I got to tell you, last week, 11 a.m., the power and the spirit of God was moving and alive. And we had prayer teams of people who were watching people experience salvation and break strongholds in their life. It was about lifting my level of faith. 
And in this moment, I believe God is calling us to lift your level of faith. Pastor Brad, how do I do that? So glad you asked. Because in verse seven, Paul says, you decide. You decide. You decide. You decide what to give. And some scholars think that means, wow, we get rid of the old standard of 10%. That was the Old Testament law. Jesus came and gave us a new law. Like we don't live to that standard. Listen, church, if I came home and stole your car and drove off with it, you're like, you stole my car. I'm like, sorry, bro, that was the Old Testament. He didn't say anything about stealing in the New Testament. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. The standard is still the standard. And the standard biblically is that 10% is the tithe. That's the standard. And so when Paul says, you decide, you decide what to give, what he is saying is, you decide at what level of faith I'm going to live at. I can live with the level of faith that is down here and soft and below the standard, or I can live where my faith is maxed out and I am listening to God at a completely different level. You decide at what level of faith you get to live. But that happens through our generosity, our generosity. Church, hear me on this. I give to this church because it challenges me. It stretches me. It makes me uncomfortable. Some people might say that I'm irresponsible. I believe that when it becomes unreasonable to other people, it is the sweet spot of faith that God wants me in. I give to this church because I believe the church is the hope of the world because Jesus is the hope of their life. Somebody's like, why don't you give to another organization? Well, I could give to people who help homeless. I could give to other organizations. But let me say this. If Jesus is not at the center of that organization, the right healing will never take place because they will always keep searching for something to replace the void that is in their life. I give because we are about extending the hope of Jesus and unlocking the blessing of God in this world. That's where we are. That's where I want us to be. Yo, lift your level of faith. Turn to somebody next to you, say, lift your level. Turn to somebody next to you, say, lift your level. Say it online, lift your level, and then stand to your feet because you believe you're doing it. And let's pray. God, we're grateful for the work you've done today. I believe that your mercy, I believe that your forgiveness, I believe that your peace is meeting somebody in this moment. It's not even about the money. It's about knowing that you are for them and that in this moment, you want them to live at a higher level of faith. God, I pray that we as a church would continue to grow in our faith that we would take the little that we do have and we would ask that you would do abundantly beyond our own ability and more than we could ask or imagine. And so today we put our faith, we put our families, we put our finances, we put this city and we put the lives of everybody that you love in your hands today. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, everybody said, amen, amen.